first of all, just to you know, veer off from your remarks, um, a number of Western museums like uh, the Louvre and the Guggenheim have made expansion overseas, creating new museums, a key part of their strategy. MoMA is not doing that, and I'm curious what, what's driving that decision? Well, it's a great question because we get asked probably two or three times a year, maybe more, by cities and countries whether we'd be interested in developing uh, satellite institutions elsewhere in the world. And we thought about it a lot, especially uh, in the late 1980s when there was urgency uh, in different regions of the world to develop uh, museums, partially because I think countries see and cities see museums today as a kind of preeminent civic institution where maybe uh, 100 years ago it might have been a library or a symphony hall. Museums have emerged, and especially art museums have emerged, as critical to the kind of civic life that many cities in imagine for themselves. And the issue with developing, as we thought about it, uh, a sister institution that was to share the same ideas and fundamental commitments that we have is the problem of the story we tell is very particular. The, the works of art we've acquired, the way in which we think about displaying them, uh, are dependent on unique conditions and unique relationships. So if your critical works of art aren't in New York, you can't tell the story the same way. Uh, and the idea of trying to replicate with other works of art that aren't the ones we might have collected or from our collection that we don't normally show, in a way created the problem of an, of an institution that wasn't going to reflect the very ideas that we stand for. Which doesn't mean that was the only decision to make because there, there are many different ways of engaging the world and certainly the Guggenheim strategy of developing institutions in the Middle East or uh, in Spain, uh, possibly uh, elsewhere uh, in the world, uh, has its own legs, but it also alters what the institution is. Uh, and we really thought, as we grappled with that kind of possibility, that we were founded first and foremost as a New York City institution. Where we're located uh, is absolutely integral to our identity. Uh, and that we did not feel that being located in New York precluded our ability to have a rich relationship with collectors, with artists, with other institutions uh, around the world. And so ultimately we decided that our New Yorkness was a strength and that our commitment had to be to use it as a platform for broadening our engagement around the world. So how does that New Yorkness sort of, uh, you know, help you sort of have an international basis? So we started with thinking about how to develop partnerships with existing institutions that had their own programs, their own agendas, but where we could work together productively to produce interesting exhibitions or programs. And uh, in uh, 2004, we did Das MoMA in Berlin, uh, which at the time was, I think, one of the most popular exhibitions uh, ever in Germany. Uh, and it grew out of a conversation with colleagues at the Neue National Gallery about, well, what would happen if we uh, worked with you on a major exhibition that surveyed the, the great works in our collection? And that was one result. We helped create the Mori Art Museum, which was developed by Minoru Mori, part of a large urban development uh, in Roppongi in Tokyo. And the idea was to provide advice, guidance, uh, and support uh, as he was building his own museum with its own identity, but to absolutely share works of art for exhibitions, to have uh, conversations with their curators and with our curators, and to, in a sense, help them uh, become part of the international network that they wanted to be. We've done partnerships with the uh, Art Gallery of Western Australia in Perth. Uh, so there are ways of connecting in uh, and I think the reason that institutions want to work with us is obviously the brilliance 
of a collection that has been nurtured now over almost 90 decades and is one of the preeminent collections of modern art in the world, uh, a research staff that's unparalleled, uh, and the desire on our part to have really good relationships with colleagues that nurture new ideas. Is there sort of uh, impetus to sort of you know, really expand beyond sort of the Western tradition of art and become truly an international museum of modern art? Well, it's this question we, we talk about all the time, and what, what does that actually mean? Uh, there are certainly competing ideas of modernity and of modernism that are very important to think about, embrace, and somehow bring into the conversation at the Museum of Modern Art. And Scenes for a New Heritage, the exhibition that we just opened, actually displays something like uh, 25 or 30 works of art recently acquired for the first time. Uh, and is absolutely about showing the connectedness and uh, tension, right? They're, they're, it's not one thing. It's sometimes there's a tight relationship and sometimes there's real uh, dissonance between artists uh, from different parts of, of the world. And we try to umbrella that to show that, uh, that there is a conversation that can be had at the Museum of Modern Art with competing in different points of view. Is there an example that sort of capsulizes that? Well, sure. There's, you know, there are artists like uh, Nalini Malani, M Nalini Malani, uh, who is from India, and who tells her stories using traditional Indian storytelling techniques. Right. Uh, her her work goes back and references the Ramayana and oral traditions of storytelling, uh, and yet she's managed to find a way to in to do that that can engage us today. Right. She uses an old technique to tell a, con a current story. Uh, or uh, Shazia Sikander, uh, a Pakistani artist now living uh, here uh, in the United States, uh, who uses miniature painting techniques. Actually, she was part of a group of people, maybe primarily the first person, to have revived an old ancient technique of painting to tell contemporary stories. You know, if you looked at their work in isolation, you would say, well, that's interesting, but it really talks about a tradition that isn't part of our tradition. Uh, but if you expand the conversation a little bit, you realize that she's grappling with some of the same problems that contemporary artists are, how to tell stories about the world today, uh, how, to, how to take tradition, bend it, break it, and replay it. Uh, and I think the same thing is true with Nalini's work. Right. It's interesting. It wasn't that long ago that um, modern art was considered inaccessible, that you know, people, oh, my kid can paint that. And, not, and now, you know, lines around the block, in the 20 years you've been there, you know, the you know, admissions have more than doubled. What has changed? How did modern art become sort of, you know, part of the mainstream conversation? It's a fascinating question, and I, you know, I don't know that there's a single answer to it, but it's something that we think about a lot. Uh, I think, you know, when I was a graduate student uh, in the late 1970s, uh, you couldn't take a course when I f first went to graduate school on modern art. It literally wasn't taught. Uh, in the middle of my time uh, in graduate school, uh, T.J. Clark came to, to the university. It was the first time. And, and it was a disruption. There were faculty who were prepared to quit over the introduction of a conversation about modern art in art history. So that wasn't that long ago. Uh, and when I graduated from uh, school, you, if you went to the modern or contemporary galleries at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston or at any other major museum other than the Museum of Modern Art, you pretty much had them to yourself because the interest was in you know, French painting of the 19th century or early Renaissance painting. It doesn't matter. It was anywhere but uh, modern and contemporary art. And then over the course of really the 90s, modern and contemporary art emerged as kind of the defining art that people wanted to collect, to see, to talk about. Partially, I think it was because museums like MoMA did a very good job in arguing the relevance of modern art to any kind of conversation. In fact, uh, the founding director of the museum, Alfred Barr, saw his mission to make modern art as interesting and important as the art of the immediate past. 
That, that was a goal, to put it in that conversation. It took a long time to get there uh, in, a, in a large sense because it, it required a lot of forces coming together. Uh, the rise of a whole new generation of artists who spoke well uh, and by which I mean who addressed issues that had a popular broad uh, concern. It was brilliant art historians and curators making exhibitions that were incredibly compelling. It was the art market taking off and suddenly uh, modern and contemporary art was more valuable. It, it, it was not one, one thing but a whole range of things and of course places like the Museum of Modern Art uh, were at the center of at least the uh, intellectual and scholarly conversation about art. Right. And now, you know, you, you guys are in the midst or about to embark on a very large expansion. But what's sort of the strategic, you know, vision driving that? So our expansion, which is really an extension, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not a huge expansion, but it, uh, it is all about providing more gallery space, first and foremost. The, the goal of this project is to enable more of our collection to be seen under the most optimal conditions. We have probably the largest collection of modern art in the world. We want to be able to, on a regular basis, show different points of view works of art from outside the normal canon that we show in relationship to those works of art that have become iconic and defined with the museum. And that's a, that requires more space. Uh, it requires rethinking how we display and install the collection. Uh, and the driver behind this extension is really to provide critically needed gallery space in order to better display more of our collection. And how are you going to open it up more to the public and sort of accessibility, you know, for people who are maybe not paying the $25 admission fee? Well, you know, it's interesting. We, we're a privately funded institution. We don't get any city or state uh, or for federal funding for that matter. So essentially, uh, we rely on uh, self-generated revenues, our endowment, uh, fundraising, the generosity of our trustees to support the institution and, of course, admissions. But we have a whole range of discounted programs uh, to ensure access. First of all, uh, teenagers and children under 16 are admitted for free, which is one of the, one of the most um, broad umbrellas of any museum in the city in terms of the number of young people uh, in terms of age that are allowed to visit. <clears throat> we have free Friday afternoons that see something like 700 or 750,000 people a year visit the museum. Uh, and we have a broad range of discounted programs so that people can buy tickets uh, for less than the full price depending on which of these programs they take. And we have a membership program that now has almost 152,000 members that offers uh, the opportunity to visit the museum uh, every day of the year uh, for as little as $85 a year and offers special hours for those members so that they can view them uh, at their leisure. But is there a talk about, I think in, when you announced it, there was going to be sort of this opening to the street that, you know, sort of more availability for the public to come in. Where does that stand? Right now? Well, we already are, one of the things that, that we've done quietly and continue to think about expanding is we, when, you have to understand that when the Museum of Modern Art was created, uh, that's 1929, it was in rented spaces, first on Fifth Avenue and then in a leased brownstone by, that we uh, leased from the Rockefeller family on 53rd Street. Then in 1936, we built our own building. And what was radical and different about that building from any previous museum, certainly in this country, was that it did not separate itself from the street. If you think about going to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is an extraordinary place, you go up a flight of steps, you ascend to the temple of culture. Uh, and that was a model that was pervasive, not only in uh, Europe, but in the United States. And Barr's vision, and our trustees' vision, was that the museum needed to be connected fundamentally to the energy of the street itself. So the building not only used the language of then contemporary architecture, international modernism as it was called, uh, so it distinguished itself architecturally, it also made the street the pathway into the museum. You didn't ascend 
you entered and engaged. And what we've been trying to do is build on that energy. Uh, and you know, even today, if you go in the museum, uh, you, you don't actually have to have a ticket to be on our ground floor. Uh, you need a ticket when you want to go up to the galleries. And I think a lot of our pro programming as we think forward is how to ensure that the ground floor of the museum continues that engagement with the street. It's inviting and welcoming and that we can do some interesting program even, even on the ground floor before you have to go up uh, and, and uh, show a ticket. And uh, I was curious, I mean, the MoMA has been very aggressive in sort of incorporating pop culture mm -hmm. into its programming, um, re most recently Bjork. Um, you know, some people, you know, are horrified by it, other people <laughs> love it. But what is sort of the, the philosophy behind incorporating the pop culture in it? Where does you go forward and sort of maybe walk me through the reasoning behind the Bjork exhibit? Sure. The, when the museum was founded, uh, some almost 90 years ago, Alfred Barr's vision was to look at modern art and aesthetics across as many disciplines as could be imagined. So we collected painting and sculpture. That's kind of core. Uh, but Barr actually started to collect photography, which was an absolutely new medium. Architecture, which had not been previously collected by art museums, and design, absolute industrial design, uh, so that today, you know, we have a car, not one, but several cars in the museum, and televisions, and computers, and toasters, and a whole range of items that you might consider just part of everyday quotidian culture. But we also, in the 1930s, started collecting popular film, because Barr saw the cinema, not art films, but feature films made in Hollywood. Uh, by popular actors and famous directors as expressing an aspect of contemporary culture and in critically important to the conversations to be had at the museum. When that happened in the 1930s, it was considered radical and uh, unexpected and there were heated debates about it. Today we think of the cinema as integral to the Museum of Modern Art. Think about Andy Warhol in the 1970s. Uh, you know, whose interest was not only in Brillo boxes and pop icons, Marilyn Monroe, uh, but also uh, in celebrity, 15 minutes of fame. He was anticipating a lot of what has become uh, so central to our culture today. And the museum uh, never shied away from collecting Andy Warhol, showing film, uh, and engaging in a conversation about the relationship between popular culture and art making. And why are we doing that? Because artists are doing that. And I think we want to be a place that's artist-centric, that recognizes the interests and concerns of artists, that can explore the interests, tensions, complexities of the relationship between so-called popular culture uh, and high art. We did an exhibition 20 years ago uh, called uh, High Low by Kirk Varnado, a brilliant uh, curator. It was, you know, excoriated at the time for doing that exhibition. And I think what's interesting about Bjork is that 10 years ago, for sure, 20 years ago, dead certain, the conversation wouldn't be about uh, whether this was a good enough show for Bjork. The conversation would have been, how could the Museum of Modern Art show Bjork? Conversation today is, is this the right exhibition? to, uh, for Bjork. And I think that's a tremendous change in accepting the fact that, there, that popular culture is not going to destroy high art, but that there's a dynamic, interesting relationship between popular culture and other aspects of the visual arts. I guess that's a bit of progress, right? Um, well, thank you very, very much for your time. Um, thank you and congratulations. Thank you so much.